David, would you please start with your opening comments? Thank you, Chris, and I'll thank Shabir in advance for the thought-provoking comments about the Apostle Paul he'll soon be sharing. If you're new to Christian-Muslim debate, you might wonder why we're focusing on the Apostle Paul. But this is actually a crucial topic because, as strange as it sounds, turning the Apostle Paul into a deceiver may be the only way for Muslims to defend Muhammad. Why do I say that? Well, the Quran repeatedly affirms that Jesus was a Muslim prophet sent by Allah to preach Islam. So when we turn to the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament, and we find him saying that he came to give his life as a ransom for others, and that he's going to die on the cross and rise from the dead, and that he's the one who will raise the dead at the final resurrection, and that he's the final judge of all people, we have to ask, why doesn't this sound anything like Islam? The obvious answer is that Muhammad was a false prophet who came to lead people away from the gospel. But Muslims don't want to take that route, so they need to blame someone for corrupting Jesus' message. Now, at the street level, it's common for Muslims to say that Jesus' message was corrupted at the Council of Nicaea or something like that. Uh, but anyone who knows anything about Christian history knows that belief in Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity can all be traced back to the first century. So unless our Muslim friends want us to believe that Constantine built a time machine and went back to corrupt uh, Christianity in the first century, this explanation won't work. So Muslims need massive corruption of basic Christian doctrine in the first century. But there's a problem here. They can't blame Jesus for corrupting this message. He was a prophet of Islam. Nor can they blame Jesus' original apostles because the Quran says that they were good Muslims. So Muslims have to find someone in the first century who's not Jesus and not one of the original apostles, but who's nevertheless powerful enough to overpower all of Jesus' true followers and corrupt Christianity like this. But the closest thing that Muslim apologists can find is the Apostle Paul. So they call Paul a deceiver and blame him for corrupting Christianity, hoping that this will help them rescue Muhammad. Before we point a finger at the Apostle Paul, however, there are ten facts we should keep in mind. First, Paul was a brilliant scholar who knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards. The 20th century atheist philosopher Antony Flew said that Paul, quote, obviously possessed a first-class philosophical mind. When the Roman governor Festus objected to Paul's claims, he couldn't say, Paul, you're stupid. He could only say, Paul, your great learning is driving you mad. Now, being a brilliant scholar doesn't make you right, but since Jesus claimed to fulfill Old Testament prophecy, knowing something about the contents certainly helps, especially if you uh, can evaluate those contents. Second, Paul was a contemporary of Jesus who knew all of the relevant languages for examining Jesus' teachings. If you want reliable information about a person, it's pretty helpful to be a member of the person's own generation, to be in the same country, and to speak this, the original languages. So Paul was in the perfect position to learn as much as he wanted about Jesus. Third, Paul received revelations from Jesus himself. Paul didn't just decide to be an apostle one day. He was chosen by Jesus Christ, who appeared to him, changing Paul's life forever. Why would Jesus personally select someone who's going to corrupt his message? Fourth, Paul tested his revelations. Paul was smart enough to know that lots of people think they're getting revelations from God when they really aren't. So after receiving revelations and preaching the gospel, he went to Jerusalem and submitted his gospel to the original apostles of Jesus to make sure it lined up with the gospel of Jesus. Paul's message was confirmed by Jesus' apostles. Fifth, as a Pharisee, Paul was obsessed with preserving and passing on authoritative tradition. Paul describes his life as a Pharisee by saying, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. Paul's obsession with tradition doesn't go away when he becomes a Christian. He just changes the source of authority. As a Pharisee, he would have passed on traditions that he obtained from respected rabbis. As a Christian, he passed on traditions he obtained from Jesus' apostles. So the idea that Paul, who had been trained all his life to carefully and zealously preserve and pass on authoritative tradition, the idea that he's somehow reinventing Christianity out of his own head with no respect for what Jesus and his apostles actually taught goes against everything we know about Paul and his background. 
Six, history supports Paul's view of Jesus wherever we can test his claims. Even if we take a critical approach to the history of Jesus, there are certain facts we can establish. For instance, Jesus viewed himself as bringing about the kingdom of God. Jesus viewed himself as the Messiah. Jesus viewed himself as the Son of God. Jesus died by crucifixion. Jesus' followers were convinced that he had appeared to them, risen from the dead. These are the kinds of things we learn about Jesus through historical investigation, and they're exactly the kinds of things Paul says about Jesus. Seventh, Paul endured vicious persecution for his message and never backed down. Muslims like to point out that Muhammad was persecuted in Mecca, and this is true, but the persecution Muhammad endured was like a vacation in Hawaii compared to the lashings and imprisonments and shipwrecks and stoning and beheading that Paul went through. The reason this is important is that the more you're persecuted, the more reason you have to stop and think, was that really a revelation from God? I, I need to think about it because it's costing me a lot here. Paul's patient endurance in the face of torture and death shows that he certainly wasn't deliberately lying about his revelations and that his experiences of the risen Jesus must have been thoroughly convincing. Eighth, the Apostle Paul performed numerous miracles during his missionary journeys, including healing a man who was disabled since birth and even raising a young man named Eutychus from the dead. Paul lived such a miraculous life that people would touch him with a cloth, take the cloth to a sick person, and the sick person would be healed. Paul became so famous for casting out demons that exorcists would try to cast out demons by saying, I command you to come out in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Why would God give Paul this kind of power if Paul was corrupting the gospel? Ninth, Paul lived a morally exemplary life. Before he was Christian, he was blameless according to Jewish law. This doesn't mean that he was sinless. It means that no one could point a finger at him for violating the commands of the Torah. The only thing we would condemn him for was using violence for attempting to destroy the Christian church, but that was before Paul was a Christian. After his conversion, Paul completely renounced violence and promoted love as the key Christian virtue. So if we know that Paul was an extremely moral and pious person, what sense does it make to accuse him of being a wicked deceiver? Tenth, and this one is specifically for our Muslim friends, Allah confirms the reliability of Paul. In chapter 61, verse 14 of the Quran, Allah says that he aided the true followers of Jesus until they became uppermost over those who rejected Jesus. In his commentary on chapter 61, verse 14, Yusuf Ali says that it refers to Allah aiding the Christians until they permeated the Roman Empire. But the Christians who permeated the Roman Empire were what Muslims would call Pauline Christians. So did Allah help the wrong Christians? One of the most respected Muslim commentators of all time, Qurtubi, comments on chapter 61, verse 14 as follows. It was said that this verse was revealed about the apostles of Jesus. May peace and blessing be upon him. Ibn Asak stated that of the apostles and disciples that Jesus sent to preach, there were Peter and Paul who went to Rome. This is a Muslim scholar telling us that Paul was sent by Jesus. The Muslim historian Tabari agrees with this tradition. He writes, among the apostles and the followers who came after him were the apostle Peter and Paul, who was a follower and not an apostle. They went to Rome. Why would respected Muslim commentators list Paul among the true witnesses of Jesus who preached in Rome? The reason they describe Paul in this way is that many classical Muslim commentators based their views on the Quran. Allah said that he sent the gospel as a guidance for mankind and that he would protect Jesus' followers. So these commentators realize that to say that the apostle Paul corrupted the gospel is to insult Allah. One minute. If Allah sent the gospel as a guidance and promised to protect Jesus' followers but was overpowered by the apostle Paul, this would make Paul more powerful than Allah. So when modern Muslims tell us that Allah's plans were foiled by the Apostle Paul, they're not making Paul look bad. They're making Paul look more powerful than their God. And if you don't see why that's a problem for Islam, pay attention to the rest of this debate. Okay, great. Thank you, David. And a little room at the end to spare, so we'll use that up. But right now we're resetting the clock and getting ready for uh, Dr. Shabir Ali to give his 10-minute uh, opening section. So. Uh, we're getting ready for that, and we can start right now. Well, 
Uh, David, thank you for that uh, interesting presentation. Um, it, it is interesting that uh, David uh, ignores everything that we discussed yesterday and he comes uh, uh, w fresh with uh, the same notes that he must have prepared even before yesterday's uh, debate, just reading them off uh, of his laptop. Uh, now that's an interesting approach because in debate we need to interact with the other person, we need to listen to the other arguments and incorporate those in what we're going to say next. Now, when we uh, look at uh, the Apostle Paul, it is very important for us to know whether or not he uh, taught the same religion as Jesus himself uh, and his earliest disciples preached. Very important because uh, uh, th there are 27 books in the New Testament. 14 of those, more than half therefore, were once credited to or traditionally <coughs> attributed to the Apostle Paul. Uh, nowadays, uh, scholars think only seven of, of those are undisputedly his writings and uh, others by other individuals. Be that as it may, uh, they, it, it's clear that Paul was thought to have a very important uh, influence in the teaching of early Christianity. Uh, not only did he write so many documents, but uh, it uh, is also clear from modern studies that uh, many of the other New Testament documents are written by people who are closely affiliated with Paul. For example, uh, Acts of the Apostles uh, is said to be written by one uh, by a, 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 the personal physician and somehow a disciple of Paul. Uh, we need to be aware of this and uh, that same author is said to have written one of the Gospels, the Gospel according to Luke. Uh, the Gospel according to Mark uh, is said to be written by Mark and in one of Paul's letters Paul says only Mark is with me. So it looks like Mark is somebody that is close to uh, Paul as well. Even though traditionally some had credited uh, Mark's Gospel to a tradition coming from Peter. Uh, and so we, we see that uh, Paul's teachings have actually permeated the New Testament to a great extent. Also, the matter of chronology is important here. Paul was writing in about the 50s and early 60s. Uh, the Gospels are written after Paul. So Mark's Gospel is said to be written about uh, the year 66 to 75, so definitely after Paul's death in, in the year 64. Uh, the other Gospels, Matthew and Luke, are said to be written around the years 80, year 80 to 85. And uh, John's Gospel, fi the final Gospel of the four, uh, was written around the year 90 uh, and finally redacted in the year uh, approximately 100, so the end of the first uh, centuries. Uh, so we see then that uh, Paul was a very important and prolific writer uh, and uh, there were others who followed him and shaped uh, what came to be known as Christianity. Many of the facts which David actually just simply uh, uh, read out as a liturgy almost uh, start, started out uh, actually with uh, the, the first citation to a historical scholar as though this is an unbiased presentation and then it quickly moved on to uh, writings of Paul and his close disciples. So for example, how do we know that Paul performed a miracle? Because it says so in Acts of the Apostles. Who wrote Acts of the Apostles? Per Paul's personal physician. Uh, what did he want to prove? He wanted to prove that Paul is legitimate. Uh, how else uh, was, uh, were attempts made to prove that Paul is legitimate? In, uh, we, we, in yesterday's debate, we mentioned that uh, Second Peter is uh, said to be written by Peter. It says, this is Peter writing, but now scholars generally uh, believe that uh, this was forged in Peter's name. Uh, and what does that writing do? That writing refers to the letters of Paul as though they are scripture. Uh, and uh, it shows that uh, Paul received the right hand of fellowship from the other disciples. So it looks like everybody are now together. And this is the presentation that has actually come down popularly in Christianity. Everybody thinks, uh, oh, Paul and the original disciples of Jesus, maybe they had some initial wranglings. Paul was initially persecuted them, but then he saw Jesus. He turned around. He became an important teacher of, Prince of Christianity. He was so morally upright and so on. So we can't uh, suspect him of any deception. And I I must say that uh, I agree. Uh, we, I, I'm not suspecting Paul of any deliberate deception here. I'm not saying that he deliberately set himself out to deceive Christians and deceive the world. What would he gain by that? But sometimes a person uh, believes in what he is preaching, but what he's preaching is wrong. And how do we know if what Paul is preaching is right? We have to compare that with whatever else we know about the true teachings of uh, Jesus as uh, properly and historically uh, scrutinized and reconstructed. Now, uh, once we know that uh, this second letter of Peter is not really from Peter, and we can see that it was deliberately written uh, for, among its purposes, to now 
uh, authenticate the letters of Paul and to show us that we should follow Paul, now we have a, a red flag uh, raised right here. We have to ask, who is this Paul really? And was he really together with the original disciples of Jesus? Uh, um, uh, biblical scholars, even some very conservative ones, uh, are now uh, coming to admit that uh, there was a rift uh, between the original disciples of Jesus and Paul, on the other hand, and that rift was never actually healed. Uh, for example, we have here a book by uh, Martin Hengel, uh, who um, uh, wrote on the life of uh, St. Peter. Uh, so that's the title of his book. Martin Hengel is known uh, in evangelical circles as a reputable scholar. And uh, he says that this was, uh, this was a rift that was never settled. And uh, this is why Acts of the Apostles uh, first writes about Peter and then gets him out of the scene and then uh, talks about Paul and only focuses on Paul. But doesn't bring Peter and Paul together in the latter years to avoid having to show that in fact there is uh, a rift between uh, Peter and uh, Paul. So Acts of the Apostles is written to cover up some of these uh, rifts and difficulties that exist in, existed in the early uh, church. I mentioned previously uh, Eutychus. Uh, how do we know that uh, Paul raised Eutychus from the dead? Because Acts of the Apostles says so. And uh, what is Acts of the Apostles trying to do here? Uh, Luke, the author, is trying to show that uh, Paul is somehow like Peter. Peter performed great miracles. Paul is performing similar types of miracles. So Peter rose the, uh, uh, Dorcas from the dead. And now uh, Eut Paul is raising Eutychus from the dead. But when we compare the two, we see that they are miles apart. Because in P Peter's example, Dorcas was by all counts definitely dead. Uh, when it comes to Paul's account, Paul is giving a speech, Eutychus hears the speech, the Paul, speech dra drags on for a long time, hopefully this debate doesn't do that to you. Uh, Eutychus is sitting on the windowsill, he falls asleep and he, f and he f falls through the windowsill uh, and he is dead down below. Paul goes to him and uh, lies over him and says uh, the, the young man is not dead. And uh, in fact, uh, he now obviously uh, comes back from the dead in a way. But who has verified that Eutychus was actually dead? By P Paul's own confession, the guy wasn't dead. Uh, so uh, there, there is a difference between the miracles that Paul uh, is credited with and Peter uh, was credited with. And there is an obvious attempt uh, on, the, on the part of the writer to show up Paul and make him look like a legitimate disciple. So if Paul wasn't deliberately deceiving people, was he perhaps deceived himself? This is possible. Uh, how did Paul get converted and become a disciple of Jesus? It is reported in Acts of the Apostles that he saw a bright light, and that was Jesus speaking to him. But in Paul's own account, uh, one, one doesn't have any reason for believing that it happened the way it is described in Paul's uh, account. In fact, Paul speaks of himself being caught up into, into heaven and receiving a revelation in that particular way. Uh, but even if Paul saw that bright light that Acts of the Apostles speaks about, how do you know that this is actually Jesus? Because he said, I am Jesus. Uh, Paul uh, writes in his second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 11 that uh, the, uh, even the devil will appear as an angel of light in order to deceive even the elect. Uh, so uh, is it possible that Paul, what Paul saw was not actually Jesus but somebody else? And uh, I think so, that uh, if Paul actually saw this bright light, it couldn't have been Jesus telling him the contrary of what Jesus initially stood for and what his disciples continued to preach. What do we see? We see that Paul is the one whose uh, writings uh, are formed the basis for the doctrine of the justification of, uh, of faith uh, by faith alone, uh, uh, that uh, Paul's writings form uh, the basis for the, the doctrine that of Jesus, by dying on the cross, paid the price for our sins. And uh, uh, Paul, in fact, changed the Shema Yisrael. Uh, we saw yesterday, and we heard David himself reciting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, emphasizing that God is one. That was David's word, one. And uh, one uh, Paul... Minute. Uh, uh, telling us about the Shema actually uh, rewards it. Whereas the Bible in the Old Testament had said that there was only one Lord God, uh, now Paul is saying there is one Lord and one God. He has split that into two. And uh, he, thus he has encouraged the worship of Jesus. And in Philippians, uh, he says that Jesus was in the form of God, as if God has a form. And then he came down to earth, taking on the form of a man. So he's promoting Jesus as though somehow Jesus is divine. That will lead to the worship of Jesus. And according to the Old Testament, anyone who calls on you to worship a God that you, your forefathers did not know, that one is a false prophet, and he should be stoned to death. And this would explain why the Jews in Jerusalem wanted to stone 
Paul. This is one of the reasons they said he was corrupting the teachings of Moses and he was introducing something new and therefore they did not regard him to be a true disciple. It seems that even the original disciples of Jesus did not quite believe that Paul was a true disciple of Jesus. Thank you Dr. Shabir. So David, take it away. Thank you Chris and thank you again Shabir. In my opening statement, I pointed out that Paul was a brilliant scholar who knew the Old Testament, that he was a contemporary of Jesus and knew all the relevant languages for understanding Jesus' life and message, that he received revelations from Jesus himself, that he tested these revelations by submitting his message to the original apostles of Jesus, that he was trained in accurately preserving tradition, that history supports Paul's claims wherever we can test them, that he endured severe persecution and never wavered, that he performed numerous miracles, that he lived a morally exemplary life, and that some of Islam's most respected scholars and even Allah himself couldn't help affirming the reliability of Paul. In other words, Paul is as reliable as we could possibly hope for, right? Uh, in every possible way we could consider Paul's reliability, he passes the test. Now, so why does Shabir insist that Paul uh, corrupted Jesus' message? Well, as I pointed out, I suspect that the real answer is that Muslims have to blame someone because Muhammad affirmed Jesus' message, and Jesus' message completely contradicts Islam. So when we open up the Bible and find it saying that Jesus died on the cross for sins, that he rose from the dead, that he's the son of God, Muslims have to blame someone for this because it's not what Muhammad said would be there. It's not what Allah said would be there. So someone has to take the fall here. Why not the Apostle Paul? But Shabir has given us some points to consider. Let's uh, take a look at those. Shabir says that Mark's gospel was written in the late 60s up to 70, and that this was after the Apostle Paul. So Paul could have been responsible for corrupting all of our records. I just wanted to point out as kind of a side note that that dating, that late dating of the gospel of Mark, is, uh, is based on an important scholarly uh, principle. The, the idea is, since the Gospel of Mark contains predictive prophecies by Jesus of the fall of Jerusalem, uh, scholars reason, well, predictive prophecy is impossible, so if this was written, it must have been written after the fall of Jerusalem or sometime during the Roman siege, and that's the only way that this could be in the text. So notice that the assumption is that uh, Jesus couldn't predict the future. So if Shabir is granting this assumption that's the basis for giving this late date for the Gospel of Mark, if Shabir is granting that assumption, then Islam is false because Islam teaches that Jesus predicted the coming of Muhammad, which he obviously couldn't do if there's no such thing as predictive prophecy. So in, in establishing that principle, Shabir has, uh, <laughs> has denied the truth of Islam. Shabir complains that I quote sources like Acts of the Apostles, which he also appeals to, which was written by an associate of Paul, as if being an eyewitness of Paul's works makes the writer unreliable. So I, keep in mind here, eyewitness testimony, that's what you don't want to go with. You want to go with something other than eyewitness testimony. Uh, and you certainly don't want anyone who's associated with the Apostle Paul. But I mean, if that's Shabir's view, we have to throw out all of Islamic history. I mean, where do we go for information? about Muhammad. We go to his, his followers, right? But according to Shabir, you can't trust them. So this is just an interesting method. Uh, and I, I'd have to wonder if, if Luke is unreliable in making things up, why cite him as the basis for the supposed rift between Paul and the apostles? When we read this, we find Paul repeatedly submitting himself to the authority of Jesus' original apostles. So how would this be the basis for a supposed rift where Paul is somehow overpowering them? Uh, Shabir denies the miracle accounts in Luke, so Luke must be lying in order to make, uh, to make up these miracle reports about the apostle Paul. Uh, but we have writings, in, in Paul's own writings, he appeals to his miracles, and he's appealing to the people among whom he performed those miracles. So in 2 Corinthians 11, he says, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. For in what respect were you treated as inferior to the rest of the churches, except that I myself did not become a burden to you? Forgive me this wrong. So he's talking about his authority as apostle, and he says that the signs of a true apostle were performed among you. So Paul himself is saying that now Shabir would say, oh, maybe he's, he's not telling the truth here, but if you're just going to call everyone you disagree with a liar, uh, that's not, that's, uh, I, I don't know, we could do anything with that methodology, especially when you know, we're, we're about to debate whether Muhammad gives the truth about Jesus. Shabir says he's not saying that Paul was deliberately deceiving people. Well, he must be. If Paul's lying, uh, if Paul, he's going to say that Paul was lying about miracles. Uh, 
Uh, Shabir says that there was this rift between the Apostle Paul and the original disciples, and he cites some scholars who don't give any convincing evidence that such a rift existed. So, I mean, what's the evidence? The, the book of Acts, which is, which is unreliable? What do we find? Whether we go to the letter of Paul, letters of Paul or to the book of Acts, Paul says that he's the least of the apostles. Paul receives revelations and then goes up and submits them to the apostles of Jesus to make sure his revelations line up with theirs. And so this brings us into the final point. Shabir wants to know how we can know that Paul actually heard from Jesus rather than from Satan. After all, Paul did say that Satan disguised himself as an angel of light. Well, guess what? Paul understands this. That's why after preaching, he's willing to go up to the original apostles, lay out his gospel, and he's willing to say, if they say I'm wrong, I've been running in vain. I've been wasting my time. I've been preaching a false, false gospel. But they don't. They extend to him the right hand of fellowship. Now, Shabir's quoted, uh, well, he's cited some scholars as a supposed rift between Jesus' apostles and, uh, and Paul, and of course between Jesus. Um, but Shabir often quotes James D.G. Dunn, so I wanted to look at what Dunn says here after discussing uh, Jesus' view of the law and Paul's view of the law. He says, here it becomes obvious that Paul was able to differentiate within the law. He One maintains minute. that some laws, here the law of circumcision, no longer counted, but in the same breath he reasserts the importance of keeping the law of God. Does this not remind us of Jesus? And he continues later, Paul drew his attitude to the law from Jesus. No other explanation makes such sense of the evidence available to us. It was Jesus' teaching and example which showed him that in Christ neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but faith operating effectively through love. And it was in no doubt this teaching and that example which Paul had in mind when he spoke of the law of Christ. Dunn concludes, should we then speak of a gulf between Jesus and Paul? No. Should we deduce that Paul departed from or corrupted the good news which Jesus brought? No. Should we conclude that Paul transformed Jesus' message into something Jesus himself would not have recognized? No. And finally, Jesus' discriminating attitude to the law and his selection of love of the, uh, of the love command. Oh, I'm out of time. I'll have to uh, finish this up later. <laughs> okay. Well, we are out of time. We're going to move forward. Uh, we're going to reset the clock for seven minutes for... Uh, Shabir Ali's uh, response to that, and we are ready to go. Now, uh, David, uh, thank you very much for that engaging uh, response, dealing with some of the points that I raised. Uh, but I still think that David is not uh, quite uh, dealing specifically with, with what I said. Sometimes he caricatures my arguments, for example, about uh, whether or not uh, people are deceiving. I very, uh, said very clearly that uh, Paul would not have intentionally deceived people, but he himself could have been deceived by what he saw and, and what he uh, believed. Uh, so too with Acts of the Apostles. I'm not saying that the, the writer Acts of the Apostles is deliberately being deceptive. Uh, sometimes people uh, modify, sometimes they exaggerate things, uh, they pursue a certain agenda, we need to know the person's agenda. I never said that uh, because the person is an eyewitness, therefore we have, he's not reliable. Uh, and that would mean, David is saying, that all eyewitnesses for Islam and, and everything else is unreliable. No, I'm not saying he's unreliable because he's an eyewitness. I'm saying that we need to adjust the material for, uh, to take into consideration his agenda. And uh, it's not uh, Muslims are saying this out of desperation. Uh, David is saying, oh, Muslims need somebody to blame. But take Muslims out of the picture, take Islam out of the picture, take the Quran out of the picture. What do we have? We have Christian scholars themselves who are saying that we cannot take the account of Paul, for, uh, of, of, of Acts of the Apostles, when he writes about Paul. We have to compare that with Paul's own writings and see that Paul is actually saying something different. Acts of the Apostles is saying something different. And in that case, it is Paul's writings that uh, it should be taken as the fact on these uh, matters. Uh, so, for example, E.P. Sanders, his book entitled Paul. And uh, it, it is interesting that uh, David cited uh, James D.G. Dunn, because I have another book by James D.G. Dunn, uh, and James D.G. Dunn is uh, saying very clearly that uh, there is actually that rift, and it is clear that uh, there are disciples of the original apostles of Jesus uh, who are uh, actually in conflict with Paul, and somebody wrote the book entitled James, uh, which, which was traditionally thought to be authored by James, the brother of uh, Jesus, and is there in the Bible as one of the New Testament books. And that book is apparently replying to Paul's writings. Paul is saying you're justified by faith alone, and this book is saying, no, it's not by faith alone, but also works. 
uh, and that is in deliberate uh, uh, response to Paul's writing. So that rift is obviously evident in the, in the Bible itself. And uh, it, it, the same scholar, D.G. Dunn, in another, another book, is saying that this is what uh, has actually transpired. So he, he speaks about the myth of early Christian beginnings and a, a unified church. He shows, that, for example, that the Jewish Christians who followed from some of the original te teachings of the disciples of Jesus, including James, uh, this is what he says about them. For the Jewish Christian of the second and third centuries, Jesus was simply a prophet. James, the first sole leader of the Jerusalem church, was the great hero. And Paul, who had transformed the faith by opening the door so wide to the Gentiles, was a renegade and apostate. That's on page 96 of, it, of his book, Jesus the Evidence, uh, writer James D.G. Dunn. Uh, so take Islam out of the picture. There are still Christians who had considered Paul to be an apostate and a renegade uh, from the faith. Uh, and uh, there were followers of the original disciples, according to this, who were responding to Paul. And in fact, uh, there are others who have written and, and said that uh, even the original disciples of Jesus may have had doubts about uh, uh, Paul's experience when he said that Jesus appeared to him, for example. For example, A.J.M. Wedderburn in his book, Beyond uh, Resurrection. So it's not that Muslims uh, are, are here are somehow uh, the culprits for thinking that something is wrong with Paul. This was already there. Why didn't the commentators on the Quran know this? If we cite Qurtubi and if we cite historians as Tabari and, and Ibn Ishaq and so on, why did they think that Paul was an authoritative disciple of Jesus? Because those are the stories they heard. It is well known in the, in the field of exegesis of the Quran that there's the problem of Israeliyat. Those are stories that were heard from the people of the book, uh, here called Israeliyat, as though they're all from Jews, but uh, even that term shows uh, that, that Muslims were not quite savvy uh, about the early Christian histories and who is who and who is telling what. And what they did was they took these stories from Jews and Christians and they incorporated them into their own writings. So they heard that Paul was a, an important disciple of Jesus and they took that for granted. But when we study now in detail and we go back to the actual wording of the Quran, the Quran itself does not mention Paul, does not name him, does not name actually any of the disciples of Jesus. So. Uh, but, uh, David's going on about uh, Surah 16, verse number 14, uh, uh, yesterday and today as well, is based on actually a specific interpretation of that passage. But uh, while he's trying to prove that that passage is wrong and therefore Allah is wrong and Muhammad is wrong and, uh, uh, and all of that, uh, he is going by a specific interpretation. And a very important principle is that if you want to disprove a verse either of the Bible or the Quran, uh, you have to uh, disprove all possible uh, reasonable interpretations of those passages. You cannot say it means this one thing that I want it to mean and that one thing is wrong, therefore the verse is wrong. No, if the verse can mean A and B uh, or A or B and uh, if B is possibly correct and, and A is obviously wrong, you can't say, oh, let's see, it means A and therefore it's wrong. Whether we're dealing with the Bible or the Quran, we have to interpret things in a reasonable manner. Uh, David is saying that Paul went and tested his uh, revelations against the original disciples of Jesus. But he's not telling us the other side. All of this is from Paul. Paul is saying, I went and presented to them and I received the right hand of fellowship. But we don't have it from the other side. As Bruce Chilton said, uh, Paul made it clear One minute. in his letter to the Galatians that uh, he uh, uh, referred to, to Peter and he named Peter to his face that Peter is acting hypocritically because he and Peter are at loggerheads with each other. But as Bruce Chilton said, we don't have Peter's reply in the New Testament. What we do have in the New Testament is in Acts of the Apostles that when Paul went to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 21, uh, the disciples actually put him to a test. James put him to a test to see if he will join in the ceremonial practices of the temple, which according to Christian uh, thinking, it should have stopped. The sacrifices should have stopped. Now Paul is made to pay for the sacrifices in the temple to show that he is still following the law of Moses and still doing sacrifices. Whereas according to Christian thinking, according to his own writings, one might have thought that the one sacrifice of Jesus has done it for all times. There's no animal sacrifice anymore. Paul is now being subjected to the test and he is passing the test showing that he's still doing sacrifices. So there's a problem here. Excellent. Okay, let's all take a breath. We're going to move forward, though. We're going to reset the clock for five minutes. That'll give David a chance for his second rebuttal. As soon as we are there, we'll get started. So we appreciate you, you watching, and stay tuned, because we will give you a chance, as I mentioned earlier, to make calls. Or right now, take it away, David. 
All right, Shabir says that he wasn't uh, that, that he wasn't saying that Paul or Luke were intentionally deceiving people. They just must have been mistaken. Well, we're, we're I was referring to the miracle accounts there. Paul, I mean, Luke was the eyewitness of Paul casting out demons and performing miracles. Paul refers to the miracles and wonders that he had performed. Uh, that's, some, that's some pretty extreme stuff to just be misled about. I mean, if there are no actual results of the miracles that are being performed, how, do you, how is this anything but uh, an outright deception? Shabir says he's not criticizing eyewitness testimony. He's saying that we have to look at the agenda. Well. It, what's the agenda? He's saying Luke had an agenda of uh, trying to do away with this rift. Well, Luke is the one writing the book. He could just, I mean, he could write it to where they're all best buddies all the time. How do you say Luke is writing with an agenda? He's trying to, uh, he's trying to pull the wool over our eyes in some of these details, uh, but he's our source for this material. Um, Shabir quotes James D.G. Dunn as, uh, as a source on the supposed rift, and he quotes Jesus the evidence. That was written in the mid-80s, if I'm correct. So here, when we have uh, Dunn's full perspective on the issue after another couple decades of research, we have his recent position. Again, should we then speak of a gulf between Jesus and Paul? No. Should we deduce that Paul departed from or corrupted the good news which Jesus brought? No. He concludes in this, in this section, Paul, who may never have heard or seen Jesus for himself, nevertheless can be characterized as one of the truest disciples of Jesus, not simply of the exalted Lord Jesus Christ, but, uh, but also of Jesus of Nazareth. Dunn. Why would anyone cite Dunn when Dunn says that Paul can be characterized as one of the truest disciples of Jesus? And again, this, would, this, would, this, is, uh, this is the result of a couple of extra decades of study. What was it that convinced him of these things? Uh, now, Shabir says uh, that Muslim scholars have described Paul as a true follower of Jesus because they, you know, didn't know that much about history. It's not the Quran that mentions Paul. Well, even here, according to uh, certain Muslims, yeah, the, Paul, the, 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 the Quran does mention him. This is chapter 36, verses 13 to 16. And set out to them an example of the people of the town when the apostles came to them. When we sent to them two, they rejected the both of them. Then we strengthened them with a third. So they said, surely we are apostles to you. They said, you are not but mortals like ourselves, nor has the beneficent God revealed anything you only lie. They said, our Lord knows that we are most surely apostles to you. So uh, there are apostles sent, and the, the city supposedly here is Antioch. And we find in Muslim sources, even though, even though Ibn Kathir doesn't agree with it, he still cites it. Uh, the names, he still cites this uh, Muslim tradition, the names of the first two messengers were Shamun and Yohanna, and the name of the third was Bulus, and the city was Antioch. So that's Simon, John, and Paul as the, the final uh, apostle sent to them. Um, Shabir says, I'm going with a particular interpretation of 6114, and I have to disprove all possible and other, all alternative interpretations of the verse. One, I'm going with the most obvious, most natural interpretation of the verse. Again, Allah said before this to Jesus that he's going to make his followers superior until the day of resurrection, and then in 6114, he confirms that he has done this. He aided the true disciples of Jesus until they became uppermost. But according to the Islamic view, Allah tricked and deceived people into believing Jesus died on the cross and then accidentally made them believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And then the message was corrupted. In what sense? Name any sense in which these guys were uppermost. They're all committing shirk. That's not uppermost over anyone. Now, Shabir says that the disciples put Paul to the test by having him perform sacrifices. I think Shabir is completely misunderstanding Paul here. Paul doesn't object to... Keeping, pe One keeping Jewish festivals or doing Jewish rituals. Paul's objection is to forcing these things upon the Gentiles or thinking that this is how you can, uh, you can be acceptable to God. So Paul has no objection to people keeping the Sabbath. He has no objection to people keeping Jewish dietary restrictions. He only objects in two, in two ways. One, when, when the Gentiles are told that they have to do these things in order to uh, be righteous and are acceptable with God. And two, he has a problem if they're specifically causing a division between Jews and Gentiles so that they can no longer have fellowship. That's when Paul objects to those things. As far as Paul, uh, as far as Paul participating in sacrifices, uh, Paul's, Paul's position is let everyone be convinced in his own mind. So Paul has no, no problem with these things. It's Shabir who's, who's, who's saddling Paul with a position that he just doesn't have. So where's the rift? You're not getting in any of the sources we've seen so far, and that's because there just was none. Thank you, David.
We're going to move on to Shabir. We've got another five minutes. We're going to set the clock here and uh, we'll be ready in just a second or two. And go ahead, go right ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, again, very engaging and uh, this is wonderful. Uh, so Paul did not object uh, to Jewish law being practiced. Uh, well, I, I, I understand uh, David's uh, elaboration of this, but that's not the entire story. In Acts chapter 15, Paul is in a council at Jerusalem. And uh, the leader of the council is obviously James. And James uh, gives a decree in the end saying that we will lay on uh, Gentiles no more than these regulations. And uh, they are all in agreement with it. The Holy Spirit is also in agreement with it. What are the regulations? Including food laws. You cannot eat blood or the meat of strangled animals uh, or the meat offered to idols. So when you think about blood uh, or meat of strangled animals, these are the Jewish kosher food laws. And you cannot eat the meat which is uh, offered up to idols. Now. Paul was then commissioned to go and uh, teach this to everyone in his churches. And Barnabas was sent along with him, but Barnabas left him. And Luke gives uh, you know, a simple reason, a mundane reason why Barnabas quit. But uh, uh, other researchers think that Barnabas and Paul was, uh, were actually on two different opinions about these things. Paul was going his own way and Barnabas could not uh, stay with him teaching the kinds of things which Paul is teaching. In any case, what do we know Paul was teaching? In his letter to the Romans, chapter 14, verse 20, he said all foods are clean. Isn't that contrary to what this Jerusalem council decreed? And when it is so contrary to what the Jerusalem council decreed, it means that if Acts of the Apostles is correct, then Paul was acting hypocritically, uh, uh, showing one face to the disciples and then writing something else uh, in his letters. Uh, and so in Black's New Testament commentaries uh, on Acts chapter 21, it says that Paul coming to and offering the sacrifices could not have done that as described in the book of Acts. Otherwise, this would be hypocritical. So we have uh, the problem with Acts as, as the source. And now we know that Paul was actually teaching something different than is known from the earlier disciples of Jesus. And uh, it, it is Acts of the Apostles who is trying to cover this up and show that they're all together on the same page with this. So the Quran, Surah 6 to 1, verse number 14, we talked about a lot and still we're talking about it. Uh, the, the interpretation which I've offered is that the Quran is tolerant towards people, uh, even people who have uh, beliefs which are false, but God recognizes who are the people who are sincerely trying to serve him in the best manner that they can given the circumstances. Those are the people who rec he recognizes. Even Muslims today should not claim that we are perfect, but we ask for God's mercy and guidance. But God accepts us as we are. God accepted the previous people. God accepts the Jewish people as people of the book, even though Judaism on the whole has not accepted Jesus, which to, to Muslims is a big thing because when a prophet comes from God and preaches to the people, they have the responsibility to accept that prophet. Instead, some of them um, attempted to crucify him. That, that's terrible. So as a community, there is much that, that God might want to blame the, those people of the book for, but he still refers to them respectfully as people of the book, and that's what Muslims should refer to them as. And among them, there are believers. And among the Christians as well, there are people who uh, are, are believers, they are faithful, and the Quran praises them. Uh, despite the theological problems, the Quran in Surah 5, verse number 48, says that uh, so things will remain. If God wanted, he could have brought everybody all together in the same faith, but he will remain so. He will test them according to that which has been given to them. And uh, when we return to God in the life hereafter, that is when he is going to explain to us the truth about the things that we differed upon. We might debate here, and we can't settle all of the issues and debate. What about the late date of Mark? Do I subscribe to the philosophy of those scholars who say Jesus could not have predicted the future? No. But what we're noticing is that there are a number of features of these writings uh, which when put together in their, old, uh, their historical context, when scholars try to make sense of the whole evolution and uh, development of Christianity and its writings, this is where they place Mark. And it's not because scholars with that philosophical bias alone, even uh, conservative scholars such as, uh, for example, F.F. Uh, F. Bruce, uh, in, in a book which is actually celebrated by evangelical Christians, a, a document uh, entitled uh, The Reliability of the New Testament Documents. Uh, so in that book, F.F. Bruce is saying that when you look at this, this is the dating for Mark uh, in the 60s and uh, the other Gospels uh, later on. So it, it is not that I'm subscribing to that uh, worldview which would uh, render all of Islam invalid. So I think that in short, when, it, when uh, the matters are 
looked at carefully, uh, it is clear that we're not charging uh, either Luke or Paul with outright deception. We're saying that they have uh, an agenda which we have to recognize. So, so too with the DG Dunn. Sometimes he writes a book under some uh, pressures and he says one thing, but then as a Christian, naturally he's going to uh, recount Christian beliefs. But when he says something that is contrary to Christian beliefs, that is important and that's what I've cited. I think we need both. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, we're going to move on to this next portion. We're going to reset the clock to six minutes. It's our crossfire section, as I mentioned earlier. David will be next. He will speak for one minute, and then we'll go to Shabir for one minute, back and forth with three rounds of three one-minute uh, crossfire uh, uh, debate sections. So we're getting the, the uh, clock reset, and after that, we're going to go to our, our next break. So, David, the clock is set for six minutes. Please go ahead. All right, Shabir, I, I still think you're, you're, you're putting a lot into this dispute because it's easily reconcilable. In Acts 15, notice, first of all, notice what the apostles do and the example set for Christians. When there's some disagreement, when they're wondering what they should do, what do they do? All the leaders get together and have a big discussion and issue a, a decision. Uh, that's a great pattern to follow. But what's, what's, the command, what's the concern? The concern is about Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians being in fellowship, and the command about the dietary restrictions were so that the Gentiles would not do things that are so offensive to the Jewish mind that they're going to stop them from fellowship. But this is exactly what Paul's concern is. Paul doesn't care if someone eats something sacrificed to idols. That can't offend anyone if, if the person doesn't know. So he says, don't worry about that. But when it's going to offend someone's conscience, he specifically says, if eating Ten meat seconds. will offend my brother, I will never eat meat again. So Paul is exactly in line with what we find in Acts 15. Dave, um, Shabir? Well, a few things I want to uh, uh, bring up here. Uh, first, in response to what you're just saying, that's not what the council determined. The council in Jerusalem did not say that uh, if you will not offend somebody else, then you can eat these meats. It's just saying point blank, you cannot eat these meats. You cannot eat the meat sacrificed to idols. You cannot eat blood. You, you cannot eat the, the meat of strangled animals. And Paul was supposed to teach the same thing according to that decree. And that decree was under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the head of the church, James, the brother of the Lord. Uh, so Paul was clearly teaching something different, contrary to this decree, which he was deliberately sent out to preach. Now, as for your previous statement about Surah Yasin in, in the Quran, the 36th chapter, there too, Paul is not named. The disciples are not named. In the commentaries, those disciples are named. And the commentaries show that the, 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 the commentators on the Quran did not know Christian history very well. Otherwise, they wouldn't have said uh, Simon, John, and Paul. They would have said uh, Peter, James, and John for the three. Okay. And David, right Actually, I, I think that shows that Muslims understood history very well. They understood that these were, these were authoritative apostles in the church, and we know that Paul did go to Antioch, which supposedly is the city name. And again, Muslims are reading this in the context of Islamic history, where Allah is protecting the true followers. So if Paul is authoritative, he must be a true follower. As for the, the Acts 15 passage, the, notice what's being said. Tell the unbelievers not to do these things. Uh, and and you, you point out, Paul, well, Paul says, you know, uh, none of, all food is clean. Well, guess what? You find the same thing in the Gospel of Mark. Paul is pointing out, if you don't know where food comes, don't, you don't need to know. Why? Because an idol is nothing. Now, do you disagree with that? Do you think if something is sacrificed to an idol that it is actually somehow unclean? The obvious intention, because that's, that's the source of the entire discussion in Acts 15, is this distinction between the Jewish and the Gentile dietary restrictions and how this is going to violate fellowship. That's the concern. Paul has the same concern and comes to the same conclusion. Shabir? Uh, well, as for the Quranic uh, depiction of, of uh, supporting the disciples of Jesus, uh, I think we've already explained this at length, and I don't see why, David, you want to just insist that the Quran is wrong on this point. Uh, the, the, the Quran is uh, welcoming the Christians as they are with their faults. Uh, we cannot hold Christians responsible. For example, Christians born after the Council of Nicaea grew up in a milieu in which all they know is the Trinity. Jesus is the Son of God. So what? Is the Quran going to blame Christians in those 300 years because they knew nothing better than to follow what their parents have taught them and what they heard in, in church? The, the Quran is accepting them as they are, knowing them to be good people and uh, seeing the goodness in their hearts and in their actions. As for Acts chapter 15, I think you quite wrong on that. Uh, it is clear that uh, the meat sacrificed to idols is declared to be Ten impure. Seconds. And uh, Jesus in, the, in Revelation uh, chapter 2, when he comes back, will actually 
blame those churches that eat meat sacrificed to idols. Okay, David, one more minute. All right, now Shabir says that, uh, that there's no problem with the Quran saying it affirmed Jesus' true uh, apostles and that he said he would make them uppermost even though these apostles eventually were teaching that he's the divine son of God who died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead and that this is the version of Christianity which permeated the Roman Empire. And Shabir says, well, you know, God's just tolerant of this. But I mean, think of what God is supposedly being tolerant about here. It's saying Jesus is the divine son of God who died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead. This is some major, uh, this has some major uh, concerns as far as Islam. And so to think, well, you know, God just doesn't mind that much until Islam comes along. But God is actually involved, according to Islam, in one, in, in producing the belief in Jesus' death and his resurrection. But then once the message has been preserved, it's not just that God is allowing it to spread. He says he aided those Christians until they became uppermost. So he's actually helping them spread belief that Jesus is the Son of God. And wow. Yeah. So here you're taking aided in the most uh, absolute sense possible and you're not uh, allowing for the possibility that God is aiding them in some way and preferring them uh, over and above those people who absolutely rejected Jesus uh, and, and people who are deliberately worshipping idols, people who uh, uh, deliberately say that, God is, uh, that there are multiple gods and so on. So when God looks at the world, who are his believers at that point in time? They are the Christians. And even though they happen to be Pauline Christians, they are still God's believers, and those are the ones he's aiding and supporting over uh, the, the contrary. When you say that Mark uh, says that Jesus declared all foods clean, that shows the influence uh, of Mark's gospel from Paul's writings. But uh, Matthew, who is the more Jewish gospel, rendering the same account, does not show that Jesus declared all foods clean. And it is clear in the early church that all foods were not declared clean, clean by Jesus. Otherwise, how would we explain Acts of the Apostles where they're having this council to decide the very question? Dr. Shabir Ali, you've got three minutes. Finally, in conclusion, folks, uh, I'd like to bring together everything we've been doing from yesterday till today. Yesterday, we, sh we saw a good argument showing that Jesus did not claim to be the Son of God. And to claim that he is the Son of God as the eternally begotten Son of God, you have to have a clear statement from Jesus. It cannot be something that you dream up or invent on your own. And we saw that uh, saying that he is the eternally begotten Son of God uh, leads to problems like the Trinity, which is confusing and difficult to explain. And in fact, when Christians open up that box and say that uh, there, there are persons within the one God, Godhead, there is no limitation. There's nothing in the Bible that says only three. It could be a multiple in a unity. Uh, and uh, we saw uh, further yesterday that Jesus was a prophet. That is what he claimed to be, and that's what Muslims uh, believe him to be. And he's a prophet of Islam because he preached monotheism, and he also put his face on the floor and worshipped the one God. And now, today we have seen that Paul was actually a very important figure in leading Christians away from Jesus' uh, monotheism and, uh, and the idea that Jesus was a prophet of God. Paul began to preach that Jesus was the Son of God, and more than this, that uh, Jesus was somehow a divine a being that came down on earth uh, in the form of a human being, and so he directed people to worship uh, uh, Jesus. And uh, uh, that would mean that uh, he, according to Deuteronomy chapter 13, qualifies as a false prophet. And that explains why the Jews wanted to stone him. And it explains why uh, s s some of the early disciples of Jesus did not believe Paul to be a true apostle. Uh, when he came to Jerusalem, it says in Acts of the Apostles that they feared him because he used to persecute the church. But why would those who are filled with the Holy Spirit fear another person who Jesus had just spoken with and, and presumably he's also filled with the Holy Spirit? Doesn't make sense. What makes more sense is that they suspected that Paul is not quite right. Uh, he's not really a disciple of Jesus. Something is wrong here. Moreover, they put him to the test when they heard that he was preaching something against the original teachings of Jesus and his disciples. And uh, according to the Acts of the Apostles, he went along with the test trying to show that he was uh, following Jesus, but we know from his writings that he preached something different. For example, Romans chapter 14, verse 20, where he says all foods are clean. And we see that uh, in the Jerusalem Council, they're deliberately saying you cannot say that uh, if meat sacrificed to idols can be eaten. In fact, this is forbidden uh, for Jew and Gentile alike. And uh, moreover, in Revelation, when Jesus comes back in chapter 2, it says that Jesus will blame all of those churches which ate the meat uh, uh, sacrificed to idols. So in, in sum, we see that Paul, though being responsible for the belief in justification by faith alone, uh, the idea that uh, the works uh, can be done away with and that Jesus died for your sins once and for all so you don't have to follow the law, uh, all of these are beliefs which uh, are quite clearly uh, uh, credited to the writings of Paul and uh, Paul 
uh, has actually hijacked Christianity in this way. Islam tries to bring Christianity back to Jesus. Okay, we're going to reset that clock, and David, you have three minutes to take us uh, to our very end of this uh, first debate here, so go right ahead. All right, well, Shabir uh, insists that Paul just completely does away with uh, following God's commands. I'll, I'll quote him because you can see that uh, his real view here, 1 Corinthians 7.19, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. Uh, so he emphasizes keeping the commandments, um, but, but he, he, he's able to distinguish, he's able to distinguish uh, among the commandments what applies and what was just, uh, you know, not for the Gentiles. But guess what? Jesus makes distinctions in the law too. Jesus emphasizes uh, love as the law that we're supposed to follow. Paul does the same thing. Why? The Jewish rabbis didn't say that. Paul got this from Jesus. So w Paul is completely in line with the teachings of Jesus. Um, uh, Shabir says, uh, Shabir says that, I'm um, oh, sorry. Shabir says that when Jesus said all foods are clean, this shows Pauline influence. Not if you go, not if you toss out that uh, late date of, uh, of Mark. If you actually look at the dating, uh, Acts had to be written in the early 60s, and, it, and that's part two of, the, of Luke Acts. And so Luke is written before that, and this would put Mark much earlier. If you're saying Paul had that much influence on the early church, that it, he had completely corrupted that and no one could escape from his corruption, Shabir still thinks this isn't a problem for Islam when Allah is supposedly protecting the true followers of Jesus. Now Shabir sums up, oh, we've seen that Jesus is a prophet. No, according to all of our sources, all of our sources, Jesus is the divine son of God who died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead. If those things aren't true, then, and you're blaming the apostle Paul, keep in mind you have to blame Allah because he, he's responsible for two of those three. But if, if Paul is responsible for this, for this belief that Jesus is the Son of God, think about what you have here. Allah says he sent the gospel as a guidance for mankind, but Allah, I mean, Paul stopped it. Allah says he's going to protect the true followers of Jesus, but Paul convinces them and establishes as Christian doctrine that Jesus is the divine Son of God. So the, the picture I'm getting here is Allah doing his best, promising he's going to protect them, then he tries his best, but he just can't stand up to the Apostle Paul. Now, I just have to say, think about the picture we have here. You have Allah, who's making all these promises, saying he's going to do all these things, and then Paul overpowers him. This makes Paul more powerful than Allah. And Paul calls himself a mere bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, via the transitive property, Allah, greater than him is Paul, and greater than him is the Lord Jesus. Via the transitive property, whom should we be listening to here? We should be listening to the Lord Jesus Christ and his true apostles, all of whom agree that he is the divine son of God who died on the cross for sins, rose from the dead. Where do we have to go to find something else? We have to go six centuries later to Muhammad, who tells us to go with, with our book, which say that Jesus is the divine son of God.